Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. here today because we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first 22 verses, we're going to answer the question that Job had back in Job chapter 14, verse 14, when he asked, if a man die, shall he live again? And Paul makes it clear to that answer in this passage, but it really depends on the resurrection Today we need to consider five aspects of the resurrection. And we'll take this passage by passage. There are five points. The first four verses, I want you to notice a proclamation of truth. If there is no truth to the resurrection, then we have a serious problem. And of course, if a man dies, he will not live again. 
It all depends and all hangs on the resurrection. So first I want you to notice the first four verses. And think about this. This is Paul's proclamation that what he has been telling us is the truth. He says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you the first importance which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, again, according to the scriptures. Look at verse 1. Paul says, I make known to you. Here when he says, I make known, it's emphatic. This is a declaration it is a proclamation of truth. He's saying, without any shadow of a doubt, the things I have been preaching to you, I know that they are truth. I'm going to show you how I know that they're truth. Notice he says, I preach to you. This word preached is in the middle voice, which stresses Paul's active participation. He was a, a participant in he, the fact that he believed. Now he's a participant in the fact that he's proclaiming. You and I, as believers of Jesus Christ, we're participating with this gospel also because we have received it. And notice he says, not only which you receive, he said, in which you stand. This speaks of the permanence of our salvation. If you have truly come to a place in your life where you repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we are participating in the gospel and we are standing firm and it's permanent. We don't have to worry about next year or 10 years or 500 years. We know that we were saved from the moment we gave our life to Christ. We are still saved and we will be saved in the future. It's solid. Verse 2, the word saved here is a Greek word sozo. It's in the present tense also, and it indicates a continuous action. Some people will say things like, well, we were saved when you put your faith and trust in Christ. That's true. We are being saved. Well, that's true. And in the future, we will be saved. That's true. That's one way of looking at it. But really, it's just one continuous action. From the time you put your faith and trust in Jesus until the time he calls you home, you are saved. It is a continuous it's not something we have to worry about. Well, what happens in five years? Well, in five years, you'll still be saved if you're saved today. In 25 years, you'll still be saved. But now notice Paul says here, if you hold fast, and this is what it literally means. That phrase means to grasp, to keep in the forefront of your memory. If you really take the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're holding it in your memory, why? Because you're thinking about it. Those who truly believe, they grasp the gospel and they hold on to it tightly, and those are permanently saved. He says, however some, they hear the word outwardly and they profess outwardly, but they never give it true, genuine consider consideration. They believed in vain. The only way that salvation comes is if you consider the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only that you hear it, but that you consider it and you evaluate it, you count the cost and you realize what it, the gospel is all about. You grasp the gospel and you hold on to the gospel, then you indeed are a believer. Some just make that mental ascent. Oh yeah, I heard the gospel. I believe in it. And they go on and live their lives like they've been living them before. And so Paul says, if you hold fast, in other words, if you really grasp the, the depth of the gospel, and again, it's simple, and Paul will, will point that out. But do we really grasp it? Do we keep it in the forefront of our mind? Otherwise, there will be those who hear, and they outwardly make a profession, but they've never truly inwardly believed. Verse 3, Paul reminds us that even though he was not an eyewitness to the death, burial, and resurrection event, Jesus paid him a special visit on that road to Damascus, that encounter with the risen Lord. Notice what he says here. For I delivered unto you first and foremost of all which also I received. Paul did not make up this gospel. He received it not from man. He received it directly from Jesus Christ. That's what made him an apostle. According to Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. But then notice this, Paul says, not only did I receive it, but I deliver it. And it was just an accurate delivery. He's delivering everything that Jesus gave to him. He's delivering it to the Galatians. He's delivering it to the Corinthians. And he delivers it to us today. This is not Paul's gospel in the sense that he created it. However, it is Paul's gospel in the sense that he personally believed it. And he believed it so much that he spread it which I think says something about us today. If we truly believe that we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what the nations need, and we should be out delivering the gospel that you receive. So if you've grasped the gospel, you're holding on to the gospel, we ought to be dispensing the gospel. And so Paul says, I delivered that which I received from Jesus, and so we know that we can trust it. Notice he says, according to 
the scriptures. Here he's actually referring to Isaiah 53. It's a reference to Christ being the suffering servant. Spurgeon, speaking of this, he says, Our religion is not based on opinion. It's based on facts. We hear people say, Well, those are your views and these are mine. Whatever your views may be, it's a small matter. For what are the facts of the case? And Paul here gives us the facts of the case. Notice what he says. He says, Christ died. Now, this is important. The death of Jesus Christ, our Messiah, is important. Why? It's the very centerpiece of the gospel. Through the, the idea of glorifying in a Savior that's dead doesn't seem to make sense to most people. You mean you believe in someone who allowed himself to be crucified? That's right. You believe in someone who was actually buried? That's right. But it's not only that. I believe in one who was resurrected. And that's what's important. He says Christ died. Christ had to die for your sin. If Christ didn't die for your sin, you're still in your sin. And he's going to make that point. So Christ had to die. That is the focal point. That's the center of the good news. But how did Jesus die? You know, one of the things that really breaks my heart is we live in such a sanitized world. We want to sanitize the death, burial, and resurrection. We want to make it as though, well, it's some pretty little package. Jesus was all man. He was all God. And he did all these wonderful things for us. Yay, yay, yay. And we go home. We don't realize what he actually went through. Let me just quickly read to you what a Roman execution was really like. So how did Jesus die? Well, the Roman government executed him by one of the most cruel and excruciating forms of capital punishment ever devised crucifixion. And although the Romans did not invent crucifixions, they, prefer, they perfected it as a form of torture and capital punishment. It was designed to produce a very, very slow death with as much agony and suffering as possible. In other words, they got the maximum pain they could get out of you. So what exactly does that look like? Now, by the way, those first century, when Paul's writing this, that first century church, they knew what a crucifixion was like. They knew what Jesus had done for them. So let's just remind us, what exactly did he go through for you and me? His back, first off, would have been torn open by the scourging of the nine tails. You know, the, the, those leather straps with bone and, and sharp rocks in, in there. And they would just whip him with it. And they'd go around his back and just pull his, the meat from him. And so, so the meat and the flesh would have been ripped open. His clothes, as they were tore off of him, would reopen those wounds as he's being laid down on the cross. They threw him on the ground and put nails in his hands. And by the way, the nails in his hands... They were, they were designed to hit that optimal nerve right there, and it would actually send pain and agony all through his, up around his shoulder, his, nose, both arms, and his, his fist would have been something like this because it draws you up on that nerve, and that nerve's like fire going through, uh, through his arms. That's what he was going through. And, of course, when they nailed him to the cross with his hands and with his feet, and, of course, the, uh, the, what would happen is, is he was at rest. When he's down on his feet, he could actually breathe in, but he couldn't exhale. Well, you have to exhale. And so he would have to push his feet up, tearing the, those ligaments even worse as his, as his feet was there. And he'd have to bend his elbows and pull himself up by the nails in his hands and he'd breathe, to, to breathe out. And he'd let himself back down and he would breathe in again. We think about all that he had to go through. This was not a pretty sight. This was the worst that anybody could ever do to anyone. It's horrible. But that's what he endured for you and for me. Beyond the excruciating pain, the major effect of crucifixion was the fact he couldn't breathe. And he'd have to slowly pull himself up to catch his breath. So how bad was it? Our English word excruciating, we actually get from a Roman word, which literally means to come out of the cross. In other words, what is, what is excruciating? Excruciating is something that comes out of the cross. It is the maximum pain that you can inflict on someone to hurt them as bad. The Romans knew no other way to hurt you any worse than this. That's what's excruciating. I find it interesting that that Roman word means coming out of the cross. Because coming out of the cross was excruciating pain for your sin and for my sin. However, we don't speak about the physical sufferings of Jesus to make us feel sorry for him. Because he doesn't need our pity. If we want to pity somebody, we need to pity those who do not know Jesus. And we need to pity the preachers who don't have the boldness to stand in pulpits today and proclaim the word of God that Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross for your sin. He was buried for three days and he rose from the grave. God have mercy on their souls. May they have the spirit of the apostle Paul. That's what we need. We need people filled with the spirit of the apostle Paul that was so in love, so committed to Jesus Christ, it didn't matter what they had to face. Notice it says here, Christ died, but why did he die? For our sins. 
So what does it mean he died for our sins? Because there's been a lot of noble men and women throughout history have died for noble causes. But what does it mean that he died for our sins? Well, I think Isaiah 53 verses 3 through 5 puts it the most powerfully I've ever read it. What does it mean that Jesus died for our sins? This is what Isaiah says. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not even esteem him. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed, we esteemed him as stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I think that very clearly says what it means that he died for our sins. Verse 4, to fully grasp the gospel, we must believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The Bible says he was raised. By the way, it's a different term that's, that's used there than Lazarus. He wasn't raised like Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he had to die later on. Jesus, once he was raised from the dead, he never dies again. He will never, ever die again. He has been permanently raised. And, of course, we know he's the first fruits. If he hadn't been raised, you and I would have no choice. We'd have no hope. We'd be like the rest of lost humanity. So we must fully understand he was raised. A lot of times people don't think about the burial. We think about the death of Jesus and the resurrection, but we don't think about the burial. But the burial is really important. And why is the burial important? Because you don't bury live people. People say, well, did Jesus really die? Yeah, they buried him. They did exactly to him the things they were doing to everyone else. And the fact is, his, his burial is important because it proves that he did indeed die. A lot of people, they think he didn't die. Some people say he did die, but he didn't raise from the dead. Truth of the matter, he did die, he was buried, and he was resurrected. Jesus' burial is also important because it fulfills the scripture. And they made him a grave by the wicked. But with the rich at his death. That's Isaiah 53, 9. And of course, we know Matthew tells us he was buried in a rich man's grave. Nicodemus gave him his tomb to be buried in. So he was buried. But I like the next verse. He rose again. The truth is essential to the gospel. Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and to remove our guilt. So why is a resurrection so important? It's not something that's added on later. It is part of the entire gospel. Although Jesus bore the wrath of God on the cross because we are guilty sinners and he, he took our sin. He was made sin on our behalf according to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And even though he himself did not become a sinner, he bore our sin. And taking on our sin, he satisfied the sin debt. But what the burial is, the burial is like the receipt. Jesus died. He was buried. And so you see that is the receipt of the action of what had taken place. His death was important. His burial was important, but also his resurrection is important. Notice, therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is not just something that's added on. It is, shows the payment of sin was, has been paid. The second thing we need to look at is a presentation of testimony, verses 5 through 9. Not only is it a proclamation of truth, and Paul has showed us this is a truth, because this was what was delivered by Jesus Christ himself to the apostle, and so it is a proclamation of truth. All these things are necessary. But now we look at the testimony. And so beginning in verse 5, it says, And he happened, or and he appeared to Cephas and the twelve, and after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of them still remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. But then he appeared also to James and then to the apostles. And then last of all, as one who's been and born untimely, or one who was born out of season, so to speak, talk, speaking about himself, he said, it appeared unto me also. And I know I'm the least of the apostles. And I'm not even fit to be called an apostle because I actually persecuted the church of God. This he said, says, some have fallen asleep. Most people were still alive. And here's what he was telling them. You want to know if Jesus truly really rose from the grave? There's over 500 people that knew. There's over 500 people that can tell you. Go talk to them. Yes, a few of them have died. A few of them are asleep. But most of them, they are still alive. You want to know if Jesus rose from the dead? Go ask them. You can go to Galilee and you can ask them. You can go to Jerusalem and you can ask them. Ask those who actually saw him and they can tell you. Of whom a great part are still present. I like that. 
We need to realize that even though Acts 1.15 only mentions 120 of the believers that saw him, it's speaking of those that's in Jerusalem. But there were over 500 that was not in Jerusalem. They were in Galilee. And so he's telling them, go to Galilee, return there, listen to those believers, go to Jerusalem, talk to those. There are people scattered about who are believers because they saw the death, the burial, and the resurrected Jesus Christ. And then verse 8. He tells of his own unique post-resurrection encounter with the Lord. And that's what he said here, as one untimely born or one born out of due time. What is he actually saying here? Here's what he's really boiling down. He said, listen, I wasn't born and in, 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 I wasn't part of the original 12. Also, by the way, I, I wasn't looking for him. Remember, I was a persecutor of the church. I wasn't looking for him. I didn't find him. He found me. That's why I kind of like that. That phrase that I quoted the other day that, uh, you know, if God wants me, he will find me. And that's true. There's no way we're studying the gospel of Jonah. Some of you didn't realize that, that there is a gospel of Jonah. But we're studying that in Sunday school. And, you know, one of the, the points is, you know, Jonah kept running from God, running from God, running from God. I don't know how far away you can get from God any further than in the belly of a fish in the bottom of the sea. I don't think you can get any further away from God than that. But God was present there with him. In other words, you can't run from God. And so here, here uh, Paul was saying, listen, this, this was an untimely thing. I, I wasn't looking for him. He found me. You know, there's a, a passage that talks about the pearl of great price. And a lot of preachers preach it that Jesus is the pearl of great price. And we go and we buy a field and, and we sell everything we can to buy the field. Well, that's, I don't think that's an accurate interpretation. I think what it boils down to because we're not the merchant man. Jesus is a merchant man. He sees you and he sees me. He paid the price. He paid it all. And so that for you and for me, we're the, we're the, we're the prize. We're the pearl of great price. Maybe not in our own eyes, but in his eyes. And if we think about the price he paid for, he must have a lot of value for you and a lot of value for me to do what he had to do, to pay the price that he paid. Paul says, I wasn't looking for him, but he came to me. The third thing we can look at is the principle of transaction. So not only we have the truth, not only we have our testimony, but the transaction actually takes place in verses 10 and 11. Notice he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And grace toward me did not prove to be vain. But I labored even more so than all of them, but yet not I, but the grace of God in me. Whether it was I or whether it was they, so we preach and so you believe. These verses, they focus really on the grace of God. The word labor there means to ex uh, extremely intense, strenuous labor. And so here's what Paul is saying. Is that, is that Paul, if you had a five-acre field and had, a, had an ox or a mule and had one of those old plows you had to pull behind it, and so here you are trying to keep it at the right depth, you're trying to keep your road straight, and... <clears throat> You're out there all day, 10 or 12 hours. You're out there behind that mule and you're plowing. By the end of the day, you are exhausted. That is extreme, strenuous labor. That's what Paul says. I have been preaching and teaching the gospel. I've been sharing with you to the point I'm exhausted. But notice what he says. He says, but it's not me. It's God's grace. There are things that God will call you to do and there's no way you can do it in your own power. You do it in God's power. You do it in God's grace. I remember... Back in 1998, when I was traveling so much for Southeastern Seminary, and that year I did 12 international four domestic trips, and just northwest Delta and Kelly alone was 219,000 miles, air miles. And uh, I mean, I, there was times that, you know, you'd think I was meeting myself on one plane going to another. In fact, that year, one time, I, I came in at 11 o'clock at night, and Debbie went home, and I got about four hours sleep. She washed my clothes and had me back to the airport at 6 o'clock the next morning uh, to catch another flight that, going to Costa Rica. Uh, trying to look at the status of global Christianity and doing missions. Well, and some people say, how did you do that? Well, I didn't. God did it. There is absolutely no way. And people say, well, do you think you're, you're a lot older now? For, and I am 21 years from 1999. So it's been a while. Could I still do it today? No. But by the grace of God, I could. It was grace of God then, it's grace of God now. What Paul is saying is, let me tell you what happened. I believe the gospel, and I'm laboring, and I'm doing everything I can to get the gospel out there. And whether it was the other apostles or whether it was me, we're all preaching the same thing, and you believe the same thing. And was it hard? Yeah, it was hard. But you know what? It was the grace of God in me that did it. And I would submit to you that anything that we accomplish for the Lord Jesus Christ is because it's the grace of God that's within us. 
Those who receive the gospel are willing to labor for God, not out of duty, but out of love, out of appreciation. When we, if we really grasp the gospel, we will have such a heart of gratitude and be so appreciative, God will have to tell us two times to do it. I've said it before, you know, and, and, and I still mean it. God would, you know, 75 countries I've been to, and God wouldn't have to tell me twice to go back to any of them. If he said, Ed, I want you to move to where you name the country, I'd go. In a heartbeat. Why? Because I know what he would have in store for me. I'm, I'm thankful he got the gospel to me. I'm thankful my, my destiny is already set. I know where I'm going when I die. And there's so many people that don't know where they're going. There are people in this community. There's people on the street. There are people all around us to every corner of the globe, and they have no idea. And if I truly have received the gospel and I understand what the gospel is about, I should have such a heart of gratitude that when God says go left, I go left. When God says go right, I go right. And I share the good news. Paul says, I labor preaching this to you. And whether it's me or somebody else doesn't matter because we're telling you the same thing. It all came from Jesus. The fourth thing is a philosophy of tragedy. Look at verses 12 through 19. If Jesus Christ did not was not raised from the dead, we have a problem. Verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we have even been false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised him from the dead whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised for if the dead are not raised even Christ has not been raised and if Christ has not been raised your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins then those also who have fallen asleep those who we hope to see on the other side they have already perished and we have no hope in Christ. Let me real quickly give you seven things that are important about the resurrection. Number one, from these verses, verse 12, it says, if there's no resurrection, then Christ is still dead. If Christ is still dead, we have no reason. We should just sell this building, sell this parking lot, give the money to the poor, and go about doing our lives and eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. If Jesus Christ is not resurrected, then we have no hope. And as Paul would say in other places, we are, we are the most to be pitied. Can you imagine coming to church week after week, month after month, year after year, and you get to the end of your life, and all of a sudden you find out that what you believed is not true. You realize the Buddhist, the Muslim, the Hindu, all the, that's what's happening. All their lives, they're trying to appease gods that are not real gods, they're not alive, they can do nothing for them, and they get to the end of their life, and they realize then, once it's too late, I've lived my whole life as a waste. Wouldn't that be a waste? And that's what Paul is saying. Paul says, if Christ is not resurrected, there's no hope. We're dead. Verse 14, the second thing is, if there's no resurrection, then all preaching's in vain. I've just wasted my last, the last 30 years of my life, if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead, I've wasted 30 years. That's exactly what it boils down to. And that's what Paul is saying. I'm thankful later on he says, but that's not the case because he has been raised. But if he hasn't, then all preaching is in vain. Third, in verse 14, if there's no resurrection, then our faith is empty. We have been putting our faith and trust in something that does not exist. If Jesus died and was never raised from the grave, well, no, no matter how strong your faith is, it's of no value. It's empty. Fourth, if there's no resurrection, then we're actually lying because we're speaking for God. Because God obviously would know if Jesus had been resurrected or not. And if Jesus had not been resurrected, and we're saying he has, then we're making a liar out of God. Fifth, if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. And that's a very bad place to be. Because only Jesus could atone for our sin. I can never live good enough, long enough, righteous enough, holy enough for God to forgive me of my sin. It's totally impossible. The Bible makes it clear that I cannot keep the law. I break the law way too much. And if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, my sin debt is still owed. And I have to pay it. And I can't. I'm, I, I am spiritually bankrupt. And only God can bail me out. And if he didn't raise from the dead, there's no bailout. 
6, if there's no resurrection, then all those who have fallen asleep have already perished. All those that we want to see, grandma, grandpa, mom, and dad, for those of you who have lost children, you want to see your children when you get, all those we want to see. We talk about walking down the streets and seeing Noah and Moses, and I, hey, I, I want to see some too. You know, I want to see King David. You know why I want to see David? Because the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Boy, if, if that's what the Holy Spirit would write on my tombstone or your tombstone, here lays a man, here lays a woman after the very heart of God. He said that about David. I want to talk to David. I want to know what it was like. Of course, I also want to talk with Adam. I want to know what it was like to walk with Jesus, walk with God twice a day was that without sin in the world. Had to be unreal. Had to be glorious. You know, he did see the Shekinah glory of God before sin. Nobody to see. And seventh, if there's no resurrection, then we are most miserable and to be pitied. Why? Because our end is the same as everybody else. If, if Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, then I will spend eternity in hell separated from God like all the lost people. And so will you. If there is no resurrection, there is no life after death. If a man die, will he live again? The resurrection proves it. Jesus Christ is the one who pays for all of our sin debt. He's the one who makes it possible for you and I to have eternal life. And without his resurrection, everything hinges on the resurrection. It's important. That's why we celebrate the resurrection today. We do it once a year. Maybe we should do it four times a year. But the fact is, today, we need to be on our knees before God saying, Lord, thank you that, first off, you loved us enough to send your son to die for us. Thank you that the burial is a testimony to the fact that he did indeed die. He didn't just fall asleep due to the lack of blood. He was dead. But God, thank you so much for three days later for that resurrection because that's what tells a tale. And then verses 20 through 22, the last thing is a pronouncement of triumph. In verse 20, Paul says, But now Christ has not been raised from the dead. Or, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And for since by man death came, also by man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, also in Christ all will be made alive. Just as Christ experienced the sleep of death due to the crucifixion, he triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. He is alive today. He became the first to, for many to follow. The questions I have for us is this, is have we really received and grasped the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The resurrection is so important. Do we truly believe? I mean, we live in a world that rejects that. They reject anything supernatural if it has to do with Christianity. There are those who would deny even the, the story of Jonah. You know they'll deny the story of the death and the burial and the resurrection because that's what we put our faith and trust in. We put our faith in the trust of the gospel. Do we truly believe in the resurrection? I hope there are no doubts in your heart or your mind because everything that we hold dear hinges on if Jesus is alive forevermore. And the question is this, will you follow Jesus and be raised into eternal life? Here's what he says. He says, he's the first fruits. There's more coming. Without him coming first, we'd have no hope. So the question is, if a man dies, will he live again? He will. He'll live because of the resurrection. Daniel 12, 2. Now think about this for a moment. Daniel 12, 2 says this. For many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life but some to shame and everlasting contempt. Man will live again. He will be raised to everlasting life or he'll be raised to everlasting contempt. Everybody's going to live. The question is, are you going to live in heaven or are you going to live in hell? It would be great if it was annihilationism where if you could, you could go to heaven if you were good and you could, you could be annihilated, you didn't exist. And that's what some religions teach. You just cease to exist no pain, no suffering. You just don't exist anymore. But that's not biblical. That's not true. Daniel makes it clear that all are going to be erased, some to everlasting life, to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven forever and ever and ever, and some to everlasting contempt. 
Have you made your peace with God? As we think about this Resurrection Sunday, what's your, what's your relationship with him? Have you come to a place in your life that you've really repented of your sin and put your faith and trust in him? If not, today would be a great day to do that. I, in fact, I don't think there's a better day than Resurrection Sunday to put your faith and trust in him and get on the right road and know because of his resurrection, you'll be resurrected to eternal life.